It is my pleasure to introduce um, Ben Parker, who is currently a postdoctoral scholar at University of Rochester. His research focuses on the genetic mechanisms that underlie phenotypic variation, and he seeks to understand how that variation is maintained in natural populations. He's particularly interested in the traits underlying associations between animals and microbes using the P. aphid and other insect systems. When not in the lab, Ben has spent time developing new courses, including classes on microbes and disease, and evolution and human health. Today, Ben will be telling us about a very new project he has recently started that investigates the genetic variation in the P. aphid wing polyphenism. Awesome, thanks. So it's not controversial to say that organisms often respond to variable or changing environments by you know, altering their development to produce adaptive phenotypes. Um, and, and, and so, um, like a lot of traits, there's genetic variation in, in phenotypically plastic traits, and we had some great introduction to the idea of genotype by environment interactions earlier. In our cartoon here, um, you know, these different lines represent different genotypes that are responding differently to an environmental cue in terms of the phenotypes that they're producing. Um, and like a lot of variation, um, this is subject to natural selection, and we think that this natural selection on, on plasticity is really important for determining how a plastic response can be adapted to kind of a fitness optimum. Um, and so there's a lot of interesting questions to ask about genotype by environment interactions. Um, maybe in particular, what kinds of genetic mechanisms underlie G by E traits? You know, what kind of genes are the targets of selection? Um, and then if we have lots of variation in these traits in natural populations, what's maintaining this genetic variation? So we're going to look at the ecology of, of, of one of these traits. So, you know, we, we talked a lot this morning about phenotypic plasticity um, that was continuous, so continuous traits. I want to focus your attention now on um, kind of a special case of phenotypic plasticity we refer to as polyphenism, um, where discrete morphs are produced in response to the environment. So some you know, really interesting examples come from Lepidopterans. These are three different species of butterflies, and they have a wet and a dry morph. Very different in terms of their coloration. My phone is being um, Um, we even saw this exact same picture of Daphnia in an earlier talk that in response to signals of predation produced this kind of defensive hood plastically. Social insects, a great example. We're going to hear about beetles in the next talk. And so um, I think polyphenisms are really fascinating for a couple of reasons, but um, uh, they also make a really great study system because it's a very clear plastic phenotype that we can study in the lab. Um, and kind of the hallmark of polyphenisms is that um, these represent um, a set of discrete morphs that vary in a number of ways, physiological, morphological, behavioral, life history traits. Um, and so the polyphenism that I study is the P. aphid, Acephrocyphum pisum. If you do any gardening, you might find P. aphids in your garden. They're, they're sometimes referred to as plant lice. And these two adult aphids are genetically identical. Um, the uh, female on the left doesn't have wings very sedentary behavior. They don't have a lot of sensory organs on their antennae. This um, female to the right, which is produced by the same mother just a few minutes after, um, uh, has wings. They disperse the new plants. They have really active behavior. They have lots of sensory organs. Um, and so this is what we refer to as a transgenerational wing polyphenism. So um, the signal to produce winged offspring is picked up by the, the mother. Um, so aphids reproduce asexually in the summer through parthenogenesis, so they're producing genetically identical offspring. Really useful for the experiments that we're going to do because we can capture genotypes in the lab for a long period of time, years and years and years. Um, they also go through a round of sexual reproduction in the fall. But all throughout the summer, they go through you know, 10 to 15 generations of this parthenogenesis. Um, and so an aphid by itself will produce primarily unwinged offspring, but if um, a mother picks up signals of crowding, or a deteriorating condition, um, she will induce some of her offspring to eventually become winged. Um, there's some really entertaining papers from the 60s where they took aphids and poked them with a paintbrush over and over and over to induce the wing response. Um, and so these winged aphids then disperse to new habitats. Um, and that's great if you're trying to get away from a plant that's about to crash. Um, 
but they have reduced fecundity. So uh, winged aphids uh, suffer about a 30% decrease in terms of lifetime offspring production. Aphids have about 100 offspring, so that's kind of a, you know, a large fitness cost. Um, and so today I am going to use the system to tell you um, about two different stories. First, we're going to ask you know, how much variation is there in a natural population in terms of this plastic wing response, and what genes underlie this variation. And then we're going to talk about maybe, you know, if we do find a lot of variation, which spoiler alert, we, we do, um, what ecological mechanisms might be maintaining this variation. Um, and um, so th there will be, <laughs> I don't know how satisfying that, uh, that answer will be, if, if the answer is that it's complicated. Um, okay, so just to um, give you some methods about our kind of standard laboratory crowding assay. Um, so uh, we take aphids um, from all, all of these aphids in this study will be from one genotype, and you rear them at low densities on a plant. You put them by themselves into a petri dish, and they have primarily unwinged offspring. When we do the same thing, but we crowd them in a petri dish for 24 hours, and then we put them on a plant and count their offspring, they have a large percentage of winged offspring. So crowding them in this petri dish is the methodology that I will use over and over and over to induce this, uh, to induce this winged response. <laughs> and one of the great things about the system is that previous work in, in the lab has identified the developmental mechanisms underlying this plasticity. So how do we go from an environmental cue of crowding to winged offspring? We understand those pathways to some extent. So um, uh, signals of crowding are picked up by the brain. Um, we think there is some induction of, of signaling from biological amines like dopamine, neurotransmitter signaling. So in this study, um, they used mass spec to look at dopamine titers in aphids that were alone in a dish versus those that were crowded in a dish overnight. Dopamine titers dropped in these crowded aphids. Um, a lot of the pathway is also supported by uh, transcriptome, so gene expression evidence that kind of implicates uh, changes in gene expression in response to crowding in genes in this pathway. We um, also think that ecdysin signaling, a molt hormone that's um, common amongst invertebrates, insects, um, is involved in this signaling pathway. So in this experiment, an, an ecdysin analog was injected into aphids versus a control, and we see a decrease, um, oh, sorry, we see a decrease in the induction of wing offspring when we inject them with ecdysin. And, and then um, the signaling pathway moves into the ovaries where kind of chromatin remodeling and transcriptional changes happen in the offspring themselves to kind of grow the muscles and the, and the, flight, the flight muscles and the wings that are um, kind of important to being a winged aphid. So um, if you work on aphids for a really long time and you spend hours every week changing them, you kind of get familiar with the personalities of the genotypes that you keep in the lab. And one thing you notice if you're trying to do experiments on winged aphids is that some genotypes are really hard to induce winged, uh, it's really hard to induce winged offspring from some genotypes. So you can neglect them, you can go on vacation and come back in three weeks and the cage will be overrun by aphids as crowded as it, can, as it could possibly be and you don't get a lot of winged offspring. Other aphids, you can make the most pristine, um, amazing aphid habitat, you know, a utopia um, of, of, of being alone in a cage and they still tend to produce some winged offspring. So they're very sensitive to crowding. A lot of variation between our lines. Um, and we wanted to know um, what genes are involved in these genetic differences um, between lines that we refer to as low inducing and lines that we refer to as high inducing. So the first possibility is that genetic differences in these genes that are in this developmental pathway that lead to the production of winged offspring vary and are underlie the differences between genotypes in wing plasticity. So we might find genetic variation in some of these biologic or biological amine, neurotransmitter signaling, maybe an ecdysin, something like that. The other possibility is that maybe the genetic variation is in some other mechanism. So maybe heat shock proteins kind of temper the way that aphids respond to stress, and then that underlies the differences in sensitivity to crowding. Um, and so basically we're going to use um, the system to ask where's the genetic variation in phenotypic plasticity? What genes underlie this difference? So we started working with a group, um, with Angela Douglas's group at Cornell. Um, they were developing a genome-wide association panel for P. aphids. Um, and this panel involves 200 genotypes that were collected from a much larger set of aphids that were found to be genetically distinct um, with microsatellite sequencing. So 200 distinct genotypes. They were all collected from a single field of alfalfa um, in Ithaca, New York at the same time. 
It's important to point out that these aphids were collected really early in the spring, right after hatching. So they're not aphids that flew into the field. They're aphids that overwintered there. Um, and so we took this panel. We drove it to Rochester from Ithaca. Um, and we reared them for a lot of generations at low density. And then for all 200 lines, we um, induced crowding by putting them in these dishes. We left them on plants for 24 hours. Um, and then we took the adults off and counted um, ultimately whether their offspring are became winged or wingless. Um, OK, so this graph shows all of the 200 aphid genotypes along the x-axis. On the y-axis, we're looking at the percentage of winged offspring that were produced in response to this crowding. Um, and the bars all represent kind of the average over multiple replicates of this experiment. Um, and we found a really astounding amount of variation um, in this wing response among our 200 lines. These are lines all collected from the same field right next to each other on adjacent plants. And they have an astounding amount of genetic variation in terms of how sensitive they are to crowding. We have lines that don't seem to produce very many winged offspring and lines that produce nearly entire, entirely winged like our offspring. So the point of using this GWAS panel um, is that we have some genetic information about what's driving these differences. Our collaborators took a restriction associated DNA sequence, restriction enzyme um, associated DNA sequencing approach, so RADSeq, which is kind of a reduced representation of the genomes of these lines. Um, we identified 83,000 SNPs that were the minor alleles at at least 10%, um, so a genetic map of our genome. Um, we had roughly one marker every seven KB across the genome, given the size of our, of our genome. Um, and I'll just point out that Linkage's equilibrium is really small. We think it's really small in P. aphids. Um, Drosophila genetics, my Drosophila genetics friends, um, they like to complain about how small LD is in Drosophila. It's even smaller in the P. aphid. Um, and this means that we're going to miss a lot of genes, but also that our markers are probably tightly linked to the gene um, that is associated with the variation. Okay, so um, in this graph, we're, we're looking at the genomic architecture of this genetic variation in phenotypic plasticity. Our 83,000 SNPs are along the x-axis. Um, our genome is still broken up into a lot of you know, thousands and thousands of scaffolds, so the scaffolds are um, in order along the bottom. Um, and basically, each point is just a single SNP. We're just simply doing a correlation between the alleles at a particular SNP and our, and our trait. Um, uh, a more complicated way of saying that is that we used a, um, a, a mixed effects approach um, and we incorporated the population substructure in our panel um, and we also included um, the endosymbiont background of each of the lines which um, has a really interesting effect on the plasticity that I'm going to completely ignore but just know that we've compensated for it here in this analysis and if you're interested in how um, like the vertically transmitted endosymbionts of aphids play a role in plasticity we can talk about that later. Um, and so on the y-axis, we're looking at the log of the p-value, how strong is the correlation between um, the alleles at each SNP and our plastic trait. And so you can see that there are a lot of genes involved in this variation. Um, and so we can use, oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the lines on this graph just represent two different um, thresholds for statistical significance. The dotted line is often used in the literature, and the solid line represents a uh, kind of a more von Veroni corrected p-value. Um, and I've just highlighted the scaffolds where any SNPs were statistically significant in purple. Um, and so we can use what we refer to in, in grant applications, at least, as a well-annotated genome to ask what genes um, are, are linked with these, with these SNPs. And we found two main categories of genes. Um, the first were transcription-related, so a lot of genes that we think might be involved in modifying gene expression. I'll talk about gene expression in a minute. But really excitingly, we found um, this group of neurotransmitters that seem to vary. Um, and so in particular, we found that the dopamine receptor, there's only two of them in the aphid genome, um, we found that a SNP tightly linked or inside, I think, of, of the dopamine receptor, this dopamine receptor gene um, was associated with, with variation in plasticity. And, and so when I complain about our uncharacterized genes, our genome is actually not very well annotated, so there are a lot of genes that we don't know what they do. There are a lot of genes that we haven't quite um, come up with a story for why they are involved. And so clearly we have a lot of um, work left to validate, uh, validate some of these mechanisms. Um, and to do that, we're taking a pool seek approach. So we're sequencing pooled DNA from aphids on both uh, ends of the spectrum. So aphids that don't produce a lot of winged offspring, those that do. Um, and that will give us a sense of where the genetic variation in these genes are. Is it encoding regions 
we're also doing pharmacological manipulation, so taking aphids that um, are Represent, that represent both ends of the spectrum, inject them with dopamine and some of the other genes that we're interested in, um, and, uh, and, and see whether they have a different response in, in aphids that are of different genistic backgrounds. We're also really interested in gene expression. So um, ultimately, we hope to do a really broad scale transcriptome experiment. For now, I'll just tell you about some work we've done looking at gene expression in two aphid lines, one from the low and one from the high end of our spectrum. Um, and so, We've taken aphids, we have a solitary treatment and a crowded treatment, and, and this is a heat map showing full change differences um, in response to crowding with uh, the darker blue boxes representing an increase in gene expression in response to crowding, the red um, showing a decrease. Um, and so we have these two different genotypes, one of which is a high inducing, one of which is a low inducing line. Um, and basically we found that um, these genes are more strongly upregulated in our high inducing line um, and they don't show as strong of a change, if any, in our low inducing line. So more evidence that these genes might be important in this um, genetic variation. And so ultimately we hope to do, or we are about to do a, a transcriptome using pooled RNA from um, kind of aphids from the low and the high ends of the spectrum. And that'll give us a sense of kind of which genes are, are being differentially expressed in response to crowding um, in aphids with very different genotypes. So, um, some more work to be done, but I think the story that we are starting to tell is that some of the genes in these developmental pathways may underlie the genetic variation between lines. So that the genes underlying variation in wing induction include some that control the developmental expression of this polyphenism. And I th we think that that is kind of a, a, a fundamentally different, um, that tells us something fundamental about how evolution is acting on this trait um, um, that the genes tend to be in these same pathways that kind of underlie the production of this trait from a developmental perspective. Okay, so I'm gonna change gears a little bit now and talk um, more ecological work. Um, and so we have all of this genetic variation in wing induction. What's maintaining this in natural populations? Um, and the reason I kind of got interested in um, the immune system um, is that uh, the immune response itself is plastic. So um, we think of the immune system in vertebrates as being all about antibodies, but in, um, in insects and other invertebrates have this innate response, which is conserved across animals. Um, and this innate immune response um, is phenotypically plastic. So a lot of really interesting work has been done on this in locusts. So locusts have this polyphenism related to density, similar to ours. Um, in low density situations, they produce um, a green morph, which um, is referred to as the solitary morph. When a locusts get crowded, they produce um, this high density or swarming morph. This is like the Old Testament, you know, destroy Pharaoh's crops locust. Um, and these high density morphs have been found to be really resistant to a fungal pathogen. In anticipation of high density conditions, they invest a lot of energy into a costly immune response um, because high density is associated with an increased risk of disease transmission. And so we were interested in kind of using our similar model, but with perhaps more um, genetic resources to look at the same question. Um, and our hypothesis was that winged aphids would invest more in immunity and anticipation of their high density conditions. They're produced in response to high density. They experience high density conditions. We thought that they would be prophylactically investing more in an immune response. But alternatively, we know that wing production trades off with fecundity and winged aphids are investing all of this um, energy into the production of this flight muscle and of this wing. And it's possible that wing production might make winged aphids energetically limited such that um, they were not able to invest as much in an immune response. And we can easily test between these hypotheses by asking whether aphids are more or less, winged aphids are more or less resistant to disease. Um, so we used a natural fungal pathogen of aphids um, in every talk, I try to tell this anecdote about kind of a, sophic, a sophist back of the envelope calculation that if you took a single aphid and you allowed her to reproduce unchecked over the course of a year, aphids are born pregnant, they reach reproductive maturity in nine days, and they produce 100 babies in their lifetime. And if you let that happen unchecked, we would uh, coat the earth in 100 miles deep of aphids in a single year. Um, and you know, things are not great in the world right now, but at least we're not under 100 miles of aphids. And so clearly something is regulating these populations. Um, this is one of the pathogens that exerts a top-down influence on the population dynamics of this insect. And so 
aphids come into contact with these infectious spores. The spores burrow through the cuticle. They start um, kind of multiplying in the hemolymph. And if the infection is successful, it turns the aphid into this kind of fuzzy toasted spore marshmallow that pushes spores out from the surface, um, and the spores go on to infect um, more aphids. Um, and so we brought this pathogen into the lab. Um, we rear aphids, winged and wingless aphids, um, in the lab, and we infect them, expose them to these spores um, in these chambers where the spores sprinkle down onto them. We keep them at high humidity um, for a day, and then uh, that allows the spores to kind of penetrate the cuticle. And then we count how many of them produce this infectious spore cadaver that indicates that the infection was successful. So we're comparing the resistance of winged and wingless aphids that are genetically identical. They only differ in whether or not they have this wing. Um, and so on the y-axis here, we're looking at the percent survival, how many of aphids survived the infection. The light bars are control aphids that were not exposed to spores. The dark bars are aphids, unwinged and winged aphids that were exposed to these spores. And we see that contrary to our expectation, winged aphids are more susceptible to infection. Unwinged aphids are more resistant to infection. We measured this in terms of survival, also in terms of um, the percent that produced the sporulating cadaver, more spores among winged aphids. We use qPCR to measure the pathogen load of aphids, um, how, of the, you know, how many copies of, that, of this fungal um, APNS gene can we find in an aphid. The pathogen loads are higher in winged aphids compared to unwinged aphids. It's a, lo a log scale, so it's quite a big difference. Um, and altogether, this suggests that winged aphids are more susceptible to pathogen infection than unwinged aphids. Um, we were interested in the immune response of winged and wingless aphids. Um, and so we know that in other invertebrates, um, a group of cells called granulocytes is really important for phagocytosis um, of invading particles and of expressing the kind of effector molecules that fight off infection. We um, know that aphids have these granulocytes. Um, and these uh, darker um, globs are, are the spores in the hemolymph. Um, and so here we are counting the um, relative concentration of these cells in wingless and winged aphids um, in response to fungal infection. So in unwinged aphids, we didn't find any change in the concentration of these cells. In winged aphids, we find a strong depletion of cells in response to fungal infection. We then did transcriptomics to try to figure out what genes are being expressed in response to fungal pathogens. So we're looking here um, at unwinged aphids, and they express a lot of genes, and some of them are kind of so they make sense as immune genes. And we use qPCR to look at the gene expression of, um, of some of these can canonical immune genes like phenyloxidase and lysozyme in winged and wingless aphids. The solid bars are wingless aphids. The dotted lines are winged aphids. These genes are being upregulated much more strongly in wingless than winged aphids. So wingless aphids are more resistant, um, probably because they're mounting a stronger immune response. Um, oh, there. That was the summary slide. So a really important part of ecological immunology is the idea that immune responses are costly to hosts. So mounting this immune response takes a lot of energy. The immune response itself has an autoimmune effect, so it can cause damage to the host. And so mounting an immune response is costly. And so we expected that because unwinged aphids seem to be mounting this higher immune response, that we'd be able to measure a stronger cost. So we took um, our fungal pathogen we kind of mushed it up in some liquid, and we stuck it in the autoclave. Um, and here we're trying to measure fecundity effects of being exposed to the signal of this pathogen, but we have no effect of pathogen virulence. So are there any energetic effects of mounting an immune response to this pathogen um, that are separate from pathogen virulence? And so on the y-axis here, we're looking at lifetime fecundity, total number of offspring produced by an aphid. We have a sterile stab control and our heat-killed fungal pathogen stab. Unwinged aphids are on the left, winged aphids on the right, and the, um, the boxes represent 95% confidence intervals. Um, and we don't really see any fitness effect whatsoever in unwinged aphids, even though they're mounting this really strong response. But we see a really strong cost of immunity in winged aphids. And so basically every hypothesis that we put forth into this experiment um, came out exactly the opposite of what we expected. But the idea is that winged aphids are paying a higher fitness cost for what is ultimately a weaker and less effective response than their genetically identical unwinged sisters. So I tell you about this because I ultimately want to link this to um, variation in wing production in the wild. And to do that, I need to tell you a little bit more about the pea aphid. We talk about pea aphids as a single species, but aphids are actually a group of genetically differentiated populations that are associated and adapted to live on different species of legumes. 
So about 10,000 years ago, we started growing lots of legumes, um, and P. aphids then radiated onto these plants. Um, and we can form hybrids between them relatively well, um, but, uh, but, but, but there is specialization. So aphids off of clover, for example, don't do very well on metacago or alfalfa. Um, and so we like to use this system as kind of a natural laboratory for looking um, at evolution. And so the first thing we found is that we made kind of a panel of genotypes from all of these different biotypes, these different host plant associated populations. Fortunately, they all grow in the same plant. So in all of these graphs, um, there's no effect of host plant because they are all happy to live on one single kind of universal, um, universal plant. And we found an enormous amount of variation. So the, the, the experiments that I showed you before were all aphids from this metacago biotype. But, and we found this whole range of variation in metacago. Um, but in other biotypes, we don't find very much variation at all. There are biotypes that don't seem to produce much of a winged response. Um, and we have no idea why this is. We have looked for differences in body size, um, in growth rate, in development rate. We did lots of um, very time-consuming experiments on host plant chemistry to see if we could get um, the plant to have an induction effect on the host. And we didn't come up with anything. One thing we do know is that the biotypes are really different in terms of how well they resist this fungal pathogen. So um, again, we took our biotype panel, the same lines as in this experiment. We exposed them to spores and high humidity. We counted, um, we um, assayed how resistant they were to infection. And we find a lot of variation between these biotypes in terms of how resistant they are to fungal pathogens. So I should, I should emphasize here that in this experiment, we're using only unwinged aphids. We're just measuring the intrinsic genetic basis or the genetic, um, the genetic effects uh, on susceptibility to fungus. And so the next slide I will show you is entirely speculative, and I'm just using you as guinea pigs to see if this idea holds any water. Um, but the best explanation that I have, um, oh, okay, so I'll just tell you that on the y-axis, we're looking um, at these biotypes in terms of the percent of winged offspring they're producing. The x-axis, we're looking at correlation, so how resistant they are. And we find this correlation between um, kind of plasticity, wing plasticity and disease resistance. So biotypes that tend to produce a lot of winged offspring also tend to be very resistant to infection. Um, and it's entirely possible that there might be something that we're not measuring that is having, that is making, this is a correlation, not causation, and there's, it's entirely possible that there's something that we're not measuring that might cause biotypes, these different populations, to experience conditions that drive both disease resistance and wing plasticity in the same direction. But the other possibility is that we know that um, growing these wings makes you really susceptible to fungal pathogen infection. Maybe you need to evolve to be more resistant to disease to kind of compensate for the time that you spend as, um, as a winged morph. So um, I'm sure uh, it will be interesting to hear whether anybody buys this argument, um, but that's where we're at. And so to bring um, the talk together, basically we are using this system to kind of explore variation in wing plasticity from both an evolutionary genetic and an ecological perspective. And the idea will hopefully to bring these two things together to get a better sense of how wing plasticity is evolving across these different biotypes um, and how it might facilitate adaptive evolution or hinder it. So I, I just want to thank my advisor at Rasha Kuzen Britson um, and our collaborators at Cornell who are working with us on this GWAS panel. The biotype panel is stuff that I did um, with Charles Godfrey at Oxford um, and the immunity stuff is from my time uh, at Emory as a graduate student in Nicole Gerardo's lab. Yeah, we thought about that a lot when we were doing this biotype screen. Um, and we thought that some of these, uh, we know a little bit about these plants. Some of them are cultivated in huge fields and some of them are kind of at the uh, outskirts of the fields. And we assumed that aphids that fed on these plants that might be really patchy um, might disperse more. But that's kind of the opposite of what we found. The two biotypes that we found um, that had the highest wing induction are also those that uh, are, are the most widely cultivated. Alfalfa uh, and then red clover are really common plants to so um, that's definitely something we're thinking about, but we haven't quite uh, made a sensible story out of that yet. Yes. 
Um, yeah, we have done that as well. Um, the difference is, is, is basically equivalent to the percent winged crowding because they don't produce a lot of winged offspring in these solitary conditions. Um, that there are a few genotypes that are kind of weird, you know, four or five genotypes in our panel that are weird and seem to produce uh, a lot of winged offspring regardless of what we do to them. And we're not sure whether to do a new analysis where we look exclusively at slope or whether to exclude them or how to think about them. Because what we think is important is ultimately how many winged offspring are you producing um, rather than the slope of the line. If you have a, a genotype that's producing 85% winged offspring in a solitary condition and 100% in a crowded condition, and you say that the plasticity is 15%, it seems a little weird to call that the same as an aphid that's going from 0% to 15% in our, in our model. But I mean, that's a really good. Yeah, in terms of amount of plasticity, it is the same, but in terms of the effect that it has on your on your offspring, it's not the same. So, yeah, and so for almost the overwhelming number of our lines, that is exactly what we did measure. It's the same, and we're working. Um, we're we're still thinking about what to do with the very small number of lines that have that issue. There was somebody in the middle. against having wings. Right, so we measure the immune response in aphids that are not yet adult. And so they're experiencing these high density conditions for 11 days before they grow the wings. The wings are only active when they molt to the adult stage and then can fly away. So that's a, that's a good point, but um, we think they are experiencing these high density conditions and kind of the conspecific uh, disease transmission that happens while they're um, still juvenile. Um, but uh, I guess a more broader question is how common are these winged aphids in the wild? They're super common and they disperse all the time. And there's some really cool studies from some Chinese groups that basically went with a vacuum cleaner up on a tall building and just sucked in air and counted the number of aphids that they collect. And they collect a, a lot of aphids and a lot of them are infected with fungus. So that's what we're up to. Great, thanks.